uh, time for questions. And um, we have uh, uh, many questions. Uh, why don't we start uh, here and um, we'll expend our time with uh, Dr. Rothschild. Or should I do all of them? And uh, one why don't you time do time a couple and then, and then okay. we'll go. Dr. Falk has uh, many questions directed to him. And uh, I think I have one question also for okay. Uh, Dr. Shaheen, but we'll start with Dr. Alice Rothschild. So, okay, so I'm going to address a couple of questions. I just want to say on the issue of the um, oh, action. Let me interrupt. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. sorry. I apologize. I had a note. I left it. Please remind, be reminded that Jack Shaheen will be signing his book after this panel at 1145. And um, that's uh, a commercial from our sponsor. I'm sorry. That's okay. And I'm signing my book at 105, no commercial, though. Um, so I, I just wanted to add to that um, the uh, action film called Dig, which is filmed in East Jerusalem. Um, there were over 20 uh, Palestinian uh, civil group, society activists uh, groups that protested the filming of the film in East Jerusalem. And what people don't know is that the Israeli government and Jerusalem municipality gave the film people $6.2 million grant to make that film. So this is also Israeli propaganda, Hasbara stuff going on, but that wasn't the question. So the first question is what is anti-Semitism, which is a fabulous question, and um, how does it relate to Zionism? So let me give you the two minute answer to something that people write PhD theses on. Um, the way I define anti-Semitism is hating Jews because they are Jews, and that that's, that's the, only re the, the main reason to hate them or the organization they're in or whatever. So how does Zionism mesh with being Jewish? So if you look historically at Zionism for you know, a billion years, there was sort of a religious Zionism, the Zionism of my Orthodox grandfather. It was a messianic sometime, some, you know, who knows when the Messiah will come. And it was that kind of religious, mythical Zionism. It wasn't actually meant to, that something would actually happen in the near future. And then um, in the uh, late 1800s with Herzl and the first Zionist Congress, there was an increasing uh, movement amongst uh, Eastern European intellectuals um, to respond to the horrific amount of Christian anti-Semitism that occurred in Europe. And they, along with all sorts of other groups that were having movements of nationalism, so it's in that context of nationalism, and also in the context of colonialism, uh, developed the idea that the Jews needed an actual place to go to be safe. Um, they were kind of vaguely helped by the British Empire that promised the same piece of land to the Arabs and the Jews. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is that Lord Balfour, with the Balfour Declaration, had Christian Zionist tendencies. So there were a lot of sort of anti-Semitic reasons why colonial powers wanted to get rid of their Jews and put them someplace else. Um, there was actually a tremendous debate within uh, the Jewish intellectual community. Uh, I put Martin Buber on one side and Herzl on the other. You know, uh, should there be an actual place? Should it be in Uganda? Should it be in Palestine? Should it be a binational state? Should it be a Jewish-only state? I mean, this was a major, major debate, and I think it's important to understand that. Um, the people who wanted a Jewish-only state won out, and sort of the rest is history. So at this point, when I use the word Zionism, I'm referring to a political political Zionism as it is currently practiced. And the way I define it as currently practiced is a belief that Jews, for either historical, Holocaust, biblical, whatever reasons, um, deserve or must have a state that is for Jews and that privileges Jewish people over everybody else. And, um, that that is what's going on in uh, Israel right now and in the occupied territories. So um, the reason that I think it is really important to separate Jews from Zionists is that, first of all, many Jews are not Zionists. Zionism is a political movement that I think, in retrospect, has had really catastrophic implications, both to non-Jews and to Jews. And I would argue that political Zionism, as it is now practiced, is incredibly dangerous to Jews. So that creating, you know, when I look at the state of Israel and I look at the policies of the state of Israel, I can't find anything Jewish about it except singing Hatikva in Hebrew. I mean, seriously. And when I 
I, you know, I'm at a checkpoint and there's some 20 year old pointing a big gun at me and, you know, accusing all the civilian Palestinian women that I'm surrounded by of something, this is not Jewish. This is not Jewish values. It is not Jewish history. It's just not related to any of my understanding of what it means to be a Jew. So I put that under Zionism and under political Zionism and under occupation and under oppressing some other peoples because they're not Jewish. And even in the state of Israel, 20% of the citizens are Palestinians and they are second class citizens. They get less of everything. And so for me, um, founding a state that by definition privileges Jews over everybody else is doomed a, to ca chronic catastrophe and ultimately to failure. And I think that's very different than Jews as a religion or an ethnicity or as a culture. So that's why I keep those very, very separate. <laughs> Uh, I thank you for a series of questions uh, which I cannot do justice to, but let me um, at least uh, address one that I think is, uh, raises a very important question. And uh, the question asks, Israel has ignored with impunity numerous UN resolutions. Why has there been no uh, effort in the General Assembly uh, to decertify Israel from the UN. In effect, uh, there is no constitutional veto in the General Assembly, and the great majority of governments in the world are highly critical of Israel. But what I think one doesn't understand, and I probably didn't make clear enough in my uh, remarks is that in addition to the constitutional veto that exists within the UN Charter and the way in which the structure of the UN is set up, there has emerged a geopolitical veto which uh, paralyzes the organization at the level of implementation. See, the, U the UN General Assembly can say what it wants. It can declare things. It can uh, propose fact-finding uh, inquiries into the attacks on Gaza of the sort that the Goldstone reported, but it's incapable of implementing the recommendations that follow from those initiatives or of uh, enforcing or uh, achieving compliance with its resolutions. And that's because the UN was created with the idea that it is an instrument of statecraft, not an alternative to it. And it's very important, the UN is very important symbolically and in waging this struggle to control the heights of international law and morality, which mobilize people. There wouldn't be a BDS movement or an anti-apartheid campaign if there hadn't been a UN to create a consensus that what Israel is doing and what South Africa was doing were uh, violation, fundamental violations not only of international law, but of the most basic ideas of international morality and constitute, in effect, crimes against humanity. But that uh, consciousness, see, the UN is important for mobilizing a moral consciousness around the world, but it's incapable, due to its structure and due to the way in which world order is organized on a global basis, to create the behavioral uh, changes that that moral consciousness calls for. That depends on civil society. And there is this growing realization, I think, that governments are not gonna solve this problem and that the UN cannot solve this problem, that it will depend on the mobilization of people. And that's why in my view, uh, 
these, uh, the, the growing global solidarity movement and the organizations like uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and the BDS campaign are so important at this stage of the struggle. Okay, so I'm being asked, what is the New York Police Department doing in Israel? And there are no blacks there to kill except Ethiopian Jews. So first of all, that's not quite correct. Um, there are Sudanese and Eritrean asylum seekers who are black who are subjected to horrific amount of racism. So there are blacks to kill. But uh, that's not the answer. So the thing that you need to understand is that what um, sort of the Israeli PR is, is that one of their biggest products is security and that they really know how to do crowd control. I mean, they've been occupying a whole ton of people for decades now, and so they have the expertise to do crowd control and to fight terrorism. And when you sort of investigate this a little bit, not only do they have the most advanced weaponry mostly from us, but they have developed a huge system of collaborators and sort of, um, a malicious kind of security system to keep a population under control. So what our American cities want to do is to learn how to control us. They want to learn how to control protests and crowds. They want to learn how to fight, quote, terrorism, as it is getting more and more broadly defined. And Israel is supposed to have the best product. So that's what our policemen are doing in Israel. The other thing that is very, very um, worrisome, I think, is, for instance, if you look at the wall between the US and Mexico, uh, that is partly built by an Israeli company because they're also really good at building walls to keep people out or in or whatever they're doing. So, um, and the thing that gets even more messy about this whole thing is that um, our US military now has all this excess equipment now that we're not actively killing a whole bunch of people, we're just kind of doing it more slowly. So the military is now giving our police departments tanks and you know things you might need to do if you're doing traffic in Idaho or something. So we have a police that are weaponized by our excess military equipment that are trained in Israel and that means that we are all at risk. So I always like to remind people that this is not some you know, little conflict off in some crazy country. This is gonna come to bite us. The reason that we have our Fergusons and all the black men that are just assassinated, shoot to kill, is for a reason. And these are the kind of forces uh, that go into making that uh, true in our society. We have uh, lights, red lights are flashing. Tones are beeping. It is time for us to take a break. Uh, as uh, much as we might want to hear more, uh, it is time for us to take a break. And I think we should stick with our discipline and uh, carry on as the previous panel did and not be a bad example for those who have yet to speak. So please uh, take a break. Uh, Dr. Falk will be signing books in 10 minutes. And um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. <laughs>